a verbal argument simply isn't enough. You've got to actually do the sums. Well, I think a verbal argument has to um, be proven out by data, and one way to get data, it's, I have to say, not my favorite, but one way to get data is to generate a model that is sufficiently robust that it will spit out um, a behavior that mirrors what you see. But I, I also think that, in a sense, the field has adopted this modality of proving things because it has forgotten what to do, that there are actually features of the modern academic environment that, are, that effectively rule out the kind of wonderful work that R.A. Fisher did or that you did. And so I think it is very much the fashion to, uh, to defer to these very powerful tools, but that the powerful tools actually have yet to, um, to reveal answers that are compelling and do predict things about nature that we, uh, that we do not um, know to be true at the point that we build the model. So if we can take the example of um, George Williams and his famous paper on the evolution of senescence. The wonderful thing about this paper is that it says if, if I, George Williams, am right about the cause of senescence, senescence being the um, the feebleness and inefficiency that accumulates with age. He said, if I'm right about the cause of this, then you will see these patterns in nature. And we knew for a long time, before we could find the genes he had predicted, we knew for a long time that, that his hypothesis was correct, in other words, that it was a theory, because when we looked at nature, we saw the exact pattern he had described. And so I'm a fan of that kind of work. You say, well, here's an observation, Here's the hypothesis that would explain it, and if this hypothesis is correct, this is the pattern we will see in nature, which we don't know if it's yeah. there yet, and then it's, it's there. I, I think we need to pause and explain George Williams' theory of senescence, um, because otherwise I don't think that sure. um, makes sense. Um, the, the problem of, of why natural selection favors um, growing old and dying of old, old age, and um, there had been wrong ideas, things like um, it's for the good of the species that the old ones die off and make way for the young ones, something like that. Well, that, that doesn't work. That's not the way natural selection works. Um, P.B. Meadower, and then refined by, by George Williams, came up with a much better genetically based theory, which is that if you imagine a gene you, you, you know that any, any gene has its effect at a particular time of life, mostly during embryology, but genes go on maturing, making, making their presence felt at different times of life. Now, if you imagine a gene for um, giving you a, a fatal cancer when you're 10, and another gene for making your, giving, yourself a, giving you a fatal cancer when you're 20, another one when you're 30, another one when you're 40, another one when you're 50, etc., which one of them is going to get through to the next generation? A gene that gives you cancer and kills you when you're 60 has already got through to the next generation by the time it kills you. A gene that gives you cancer when you're 10 and kills you does not get through to the next generation. So there'll be natural selection in favor of late-acting fatal or sub-fatal genes. That was the Meadower version of the theory. The Williams version of the theory was a nice refinement of that, which is that the genes are modified by other genes. And so any gene which has a, um, a good effect when you're young, makes you, makes you fit when you're, when you're young, but kills you when you're, when you're old, um, is likely to survive. And the, the reverse is not likely to survive. So there's going to be a pressure in favor of um, perhaps uh, rushing around and, and expending all your energy when you're young in order to get your genes into the next generation when you're, when you're young at the expense of um, becoming um, uh, more likely to die when you're, when you're old. 